So I'm going to give you just a real cursory kind of look, look at what, what researchers are finding now and then talk briefly about what kinds of a, uh, applications we're doing in education, which hopefully will inspire you and give you some ideas. So this comes from Mimi Ito's work um, looking at uh, youth um, in, in urban areas. And she finds three core practices, uh, all of which are probably familiar to most of us. Um, the first one is cocooning. So what we see with mobile media is that people are using them in, in a way to build a cocoon around themselves when they're in highly public spaces. So I just got back from London. And on, on the tube, you see a lot of this. So people are essentially using their media device so they don't have to look up and, and make <laughs> uncomfortable eye contact with other people or whatever. Um, there's actually an interesting study that just came out in, in, in London I was reading about the Nintendo. Nintendo DS and how there are a lot of women who use who play Nintendo DS, particularly a lot of the brain games. It's the little handheld Nintendo thing. And a lot of what they said is it was a way, if you're in a, like a cramped, crowded space, you could actually enter this little world and not have to deal with other people in socially awkward situations like this. The second one is camping, and I, I bet everyone knows this one. This is essentially when you go to a coffee shop and you plop all your stuff out and then you now have everything you need. You know, you've got your CD, your entire CD collection on your MP3s, you've got your wireless, you've got, you know, connect, you could, you know, you could kind of live there forever with the, keep the caffeine coming. Um, and this is becoming more and more of a normal, sort of normal activity, and this is what mobile media lets us do. The last one, which is probably a little more Japanese-centric, is what she calls footprinting. And this is the idea that your mobile media devices are also tracking everything that you're doing and um, creating your own footprint on the landscape. And what she means by that is essentially things like your frequent flyer uh, club or your Starbucks kind of card. I guess in, in Japan, um, that would all be uh, tied to your mobile device, and so you would, uh, or a couple of different devices, and so you would uh, use this as a way of going and, and collecting reward points. And 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 I guess for them, a, a lot, a surprising amount to an American, a surprising amount of their stuff is actually dedicated to this sort of um, footprinting. She calls it. Um, so it, it's a way of also then you might think of it as a way of mediating your experience of of the um, uh, of the urban landscape. Um, so another entirely different one is geocaching. Um, it, People probably have heard of this. This is the idea of using uh, GPS uh, devices that, that let you know again, where you are um, in time and place. And then you go and kind of do scavenger hunt activities. Um, there are, last I knew, there were about a dozen around just kind of this Bascom uh, Hill area. If you're kind of curious, you, you, could, you could get one. Um, th it used to be a little bit, this used to be kind of a fringe activity. In some ways, it maybe is. But I think now that you have things like hardware GPS and, and iPhones, and, and as they become more and more standard, um, you're going to see more and more people uh, be, doing this kind of thing or offshoots of them. Um, this is one of my favorites. So th these are um, uh, kind of like flash mobs. Um, this was a pillow fight in Toronto that happened that people um, just put together only through kind of text messaging and saying, okay, we'll show up at a certain place at a certain time. Everyone bring your pillow. We're going to have a giant pillow fight. And um, it would have been awesome to have just st stumbled upon this. <laughs> but um, this is another, and, and there's in a, in a much less kind of drastic version, you see kids, and, and really adults doing this all the time. If you've ever had to travel, if you, if you, again, if you have a uh, cell phone hooked to you and you've had to travel without one, you know how hard it is to meet up with someone. When you go, okay, I'll just text message you and we'll meet up. And you think, well, how, how did they do this before we had before we had cell phones? I guess you did a lot of planning. Um, so whether or not whether or not everything is a pillow fight, the idea that you are using this as a way of doing ad hoc social organizing on the fly is 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 uh, becoming completely uh, ordinary. Augmented reality games are games that um, take uh, to place in the real world. I'll talk a little bit more about them, but then put a layer of data over it. So in this case, they actually have a giant physical object, but most often it's actually virtual things. So there's a virtual Pac-Man in New York where you can play Pac-Man in the streets of New York. Uh, our stuff is, is a little maybe more mundane. I don't know. We have virtual uh, uh, murders. There's actually the Dow, Dow Day game. Some of you may have seen that one of my students, Jim Matthews, designed that lets you relive and investigate the um, uh, the um, the Dow Day riots on Bascom Hill. Um, uh, 40 years ago. Um, one of the interesting places you see this happening is within cell phones and citizen journalism. Um, so if you, um, one of the first places this really became known to the, to the world was in the first-hand accounts following the London uh, bombings on the tube, where most of the news coming out was happening on cell phones, a lot of cell phone video that was being uploaded very quickly. So the news reports, the um, uh, like the BBC, was just sifting through this stuff and then trying to put together the story based on what's, what people on the ground were, were taking. And um, that's kind of a real basic version. Um, the, um, it's actually had some pretty important social consequences. So this is from uh, the Myanmar province, where a lot of the news reporting that came out to the West was from journalists with cell phones. And you, as you may know, there's a lot of uh, censorship. You're not supposed to. Um, internet connectivity is really limited. But you can actually take a video from a cell phone, um, upload it, share it, and uh, government was unable to track it. And so a lot of news got out that they didn't necessarily want out. So now the point that cell phones are um, they're trying to ban them as much as they can. Um, within our own elections, we've seen some things. So this is that quote that, that's still in the news to some extent by Barack Obama. Um, 
where he's talking about the bitterness around guns and things. If you're watching the news at all, you're probably familiar with this. What was interesting is this was also picked up by a cell phone from a person who was a journalist and not really supposed to be there recording. Um, but it's again, it's a t an example, example of how a mobile device has really colored and changed the nature of, of our political discourse. Um, this was to give you the whole context. I won't go into that. Um, but again, what's interesting, well, yeah, what, what's interesting is the person directly published it. It went around the, 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 the mainstream media. The mainstream media did not, this is the actual full quote. They didn't provide that because it was less uh, probably interesting to, to them, less controversial. Um, uh, we've seen other examples. This is one from the elections in Zimbabwe, which I think is a really interesting example, where during the elections, people went from town to town and, and uh, looked at what the election results were. They took pictures of it. They uploaded it so that the people actually tallied the results before the government did, and they said, oh, it looks like here's been the election. You know, we, we know who won. And the government, who norm, uh, uh, many believe norm, normally skewed things a bit, was unable to do so because the, the facts were out there well before they were able to actually do it. Um, so it's another example of, of what um, people have called collective intelligence or distributed problem solving. That you have all these people out there collecting data and then aggregating it and, and running on it in real time. Um, so you have distributed real-time data collection, aggregation, and publishing. Um, live blogging, to some extent, can be a version of that. Um, that looks, well, another slide here I wanted to get at, but oh, um, it, it, yeah, which I, I guess is in this presentation. But if you want to see the, the, the best example of this, there was a, a site called theuptake.org, and it's a site that happened around the Republican convention, and give you a sense of how mobile media can be really transforming things. They were uh, covering the Republican convention with largely cell phones and with GPS devices, and imagine, the, imagine a group saying, we want to cover this thing in real time, and so they'd send reporters out there, and they would... Um, if, if the, the centralized person said, hey, there's a, a demonstration going on, imagine if it was in Madison on, say, State Street, who of you is near State Street? If, that you could be able to see what reporters are where, what, what people participating in their uh, rallies were where. Then people would go upload their videos. The videos would be uploaded to the website, and you could click on a map and see what was happening where in real time. Then they were taking questions from the Internet, piping them back over text. And so you actually had people, um, you know, there was interviews where they say, well, where are you getting these questions? Like, oh, this is over the internet, and we're streaming now live, by the way, so people want to know what you're talking about. And it was like really, really crazy, and they're all doing on these mobile devices. Um, it's the uptake.org, and they have a whole infrastructure for this, and they're trying to promote um, citizen journalism. Um, a last couple ideas I want to talk about is this idea of, of real-time tracking and virtual. So that's a, a sort of real-time tracking of events. You see it happen even in much more mundane ways if you're doing something like following the election, as some of my colleagues and students know I, I do far too much. Um, you, you actually have the ability to be checking in events as they're unfolding in real time. And may, maybe some of you are doing this now. You can, you can actually go to news sites. You can be checking what's going on. You don't, um, the, the question starts becoming, are you really there in this chair? Or if you're familiar with like the, the massively multiplayer games or the things that maybe Rich talked about, or are you in this virtual world that's happening? Because you could be in a chat room right now talking, of course, about my talk, or you could be talking about some events that are, that are happening in politics, and you can actually track them uh, throughout the day. Uh, so there's a sense of virtual co-presence that I think is important. Now, we, you, you see it, you see it in, in um, things like politics. You see it in things that others might find think are a little more mundane, like fantasy baseball, um, where um, if you go to people are, are checking this kind of thing throughout the day, you check it at the grocery store, maybe if you're on the subway, you're waiting in line somewhere, um, which this kind of sport, if you're, again, if you're not familiar, this is a, a game where you are tracking real-time uh, baseball statistics, you're tracking baseball statistics, and then doing management decisions based on top of it. But the idea is that this is a whole other game genre that, that is becoming more and more popular and, and possible by mobile. Uh, the number of people playing these is, is, is staggering, and it dwarfs um, other